Hi, my name is John Savile, and in this video, I really want to go over what to expect in your first Ironman event. Now, I want to stress, I am not a professional, I'm not a coach, I'm not even a very good Ironman. Uh, but I have done 15 North American based events over the past five years from 2015 to 2019, obviously 2020, really nothing happening. So I've seen a lot of different events, how they're organized. And I've seen a lot of people online kind of panicked about the logistics and what happens and the organization. And I think you can waste a lot of energy stressing just because of what you don't know. So my only goal for this video is to go over kind of what the day looks like and what the events leading up to the day look like to hopefully remove some of that stress and let you really just focus on the event and enjoying the event. Because here's two things right at the start if you remember nothing else. So the first is really don't panic. It seems super overwhelming. There's so much going on. There's so many logistics, but it really isn't that bad. When we break it down and as we'll kind of go through this, everyone feels stressed. Uh, my first Ironman for Texas in 2015, I was so stressed and in the end it was a great day. So don't overthink it. We need to be organized, and I'll talk about that, but this is not a huge stressful thing. We want to enjoy it. The second thing is nothing new on race day. This is critical. Nothing new in terms of equipment, in terms of nutrition, in terms of routine. Nothing new on race day train how you're going to do the event in terms of equipment and nutrition heart rate power do that on race day we don't change that on race day nothing good comes of that we want to stick to our routine we don't try new foods we don't try new equipment for the first time and i'll tell some horror stories of how i learned this the hard way so don't panic nothing new on race day we've got routine and we're going to stick to that so really what is an iron man we can really think about it. Obviously, we start. And then the first part is we swim. And we swim 2.4 miles. Um, 2.4 miles, 3.86 kilometers. And then obviously, we've been in our swim gear and we have to move then onto the bike. So what we have then is we have the idea of T1, transition one. So that is swim to bike. So then we have the bike. And as we know for the bike, uh, this is 112 miles, or essentially 180 kilometers. And then once again, we have different equipment from bike to run, different shoes, take the helmet off, etc., etc. So then we think about we have a transition two, where we then transition into the run, where we do that good old fun 26.2 mile marathon, or that 42.2 kilometers. And then woohoo, we're at the finish line. Now the actual reality of where these points are will vary by Ironman. What is pretty much guaranteed is the finish is also the same place as the athlete kind of village. The athlete village is where you do things like actually the on-site registration. It's where the store will be. So the finish is pretty much always with the athlete village. Now, depending on where you are, the start could not be near the finish. It could be the bike is a big point to point. It could be the start and T1 are the same, but T2 is typically near the finish as well. There's generally not a big gap between T2 and finish, because at the end of the day, you have to go and collect your bike, which will be at T2. So there's normally not a big distance between T2 and the finish again. So we can go and walk at the end of the event and pick up our gear. But these could be a distance, the bike T1 and T2 could be somewhere away. We're not going to worry about that. They're going to organize how we get there. And I'm going to talk about that. So don't panic about where they are, but this could be loops of things. It could be point to point. They could all be in the same place. It doesn't matter. That's going to get organized. We're going to know about that. 
Um, we don't worry about that for right now. Now, all of this Iron Man, as we know, we have kind of that 17 hours. That's kind of the magic time. Now, I say bike is 112 miles. Um, Chattanooga was 116 miles. So sometimes there's little tweaks. Really, I think that's because Chattanooga, the swim is all downstream, which means you knock off about a third of your time. It's phenomenal. They say a plastic bag made the swim cutoff time at Chattanooga. I normally, I'm slow. I do a 90 minute swim. I do sub 60 at Chattanooga. So occasionally this might be tweaked, but not often. So it's generally gonna be 112 miles. Again, Chattanooga is the exception that I know of, and that's 116, but that's only because the swim is so easy. Now they, those times do break down, so we have kind of two hours 20 for the swim, which is plenty of time. We can really take it easy. Again, I'm a slow swimmer, I never struggle with that. For the bike, we have kind of eight hours 10 for the bike portion. So if you think about that, so 17 hours is our total time. So at this point, you've got 10 hours 30 to finish the bike in total, the swim and the bike time. And then for the marathon, gets us to the 17 is six and a half hours. So each segment, again, if you're fast on the bike, it gives you more time on the marathon. They do have vehicles kind of following up um, on the bike course because they have to reopen roads. So if it looks like it's impossible for you to meet the cutoff times, um, they may pick you up. So to try and stay ahead of kind of that pace, that's, that's the key point. But overall, you can take a very, very steady time and you're gonna be fine. You have the time to do these things. Again, we don't worry about where these points are. It varies by Ironman, but there's never some expectation that you have to struggle to get to the start. If the start, is a long way away from the finish, they're gonna have shuttles, they'll have buses to take you there. If there's a little distance between start and T1, hey, maybe you have to walk from T1 to the start, but they'll still get you a shuttle so you can get to your bike race morning. We never have to worry, it's a stress, it doesn't need to be, they're gonna take care of that. So this is the day, this is the Iron Man. this is the big um, event day. But let's work back a little bit to help kind of remove some of that stress. Now obviously we have to train. Now the training typically is gonna start kind of minus six months. It varies by person. I'm not gonna talk about how to train. I'm not qualified to do that. I, I don't have a coach. I just kind of do my own things, probably why I'm not that good. Uh, I push myself a little bit harder each time. But lots of people say coaches are great. They can get you on a good path. So whatever works for you. Maybe you're very strong in certain areas. I was, I'm pretty good on the bike. I'm not a great swimmer. So maybe you wanna go and get a swim coach. But whatever it is, work that out. But again, we want to train based on how we're actually gonna do the event. That's equipment, that includes the nutrition. So a key point is, generally they have the same nutrition for the entire year for all of the events per kind of continent. So North America will all do the same. And you can see those in the athlete guide. So as soon as the athlete guide is out, it's normally four to six weeks before. With COVID, it's kind of pushed back. Like I'm doing Tulsa in two weeks time. They only just released the athlete guide. But it will tell you what the nutrition is. So if we actually go and look, for example, oh, this is my site. So this is kind of my little Iron Brit site, theironbrit.com. And I've kind of got events completed. If you're curious, I have rates, reports for all of them. If you're curious about what to expect, so I'll go into more details. So I've done 15. I'm doing another, we're supposed to be five, I was supposed to do Texas, but that got pushed to the same week as the Kona. I'm doing Kona's part legacy, so I can't do that this year, so I'm doing four this year. So that will bring me up to 19. But if you go to the website, whatever event you're doing, and you'll see the athlete section, it has a detailed event schedule, which you should always go and look at, and it's got the athlete guide. If we go to the athlete guide, normally fairly near the start, Again, it's got the schedule again. Read the athlete guide. Again, it's all about removing unknowns, removing stress. But it will tell you about the nutrition. So here I can see the nutrition. So I can see on the bike, okay, it's water and Gatorade, Red Bull, these new Morton gels. Now on the bike, I use their um, liquid because I don't want to try and carry six different bottles. You might, there's nothing wrong with that. Do whatever works for you but I train with Gatorade because I use their Gatorade on the run. 
Now I do carry my own gels because they're doing the Morton, I actually bought those and I like them. So I'll carry a few gels just in case of emergencies, but I'm just gonna use the on course gels. And that tells you for the run as well. Hey, water, Gatorade, Red Bull, Cola, Morton gel again. Uh, sometimes they have salt. They have people giving out salt on the run. Uh, salt can be super useful to actually use. But understand what that nutrition actually is on the course so you can decide if you're gonna train with that. Again, nothing new on race day. So if you're gonna do that, great. I like to find a hotel, I book that. They can book out when in advance. So as soon as you know you're gonna do the Ironman, go and do, for example, book hotel. So book travel, book a hotel. I like to stay near the finish line um, simply because I don't wanna deal, I often do these on my own, my family doesn't come with me. I don't wanna mess around with driving afterwards and car keys and all that stuff. So I'll try and find a hotel. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of a walk. I have to go walk to T2 to get my bike and bags at the end and then walk to the hotel. But that's fine. But make sure you've booked your accommodation. Don't leave it till the last minute. So you've trained, you've booked the stuff. Um, obviously you have to pack. You've maybe I like to get there at least four days before. So if we think about kind of there's a, the day before, two days before, three days. I want to arrive the latest here. There could be travel problems, you never know what's going on. I actually want to space this out a bit more. I don't know exactly what could happen, so I like to give myself a bit of time. So I always try and arrive at least kind of three days is, is a good one for me. Especially if I'm, if I'm driving, then maybe just two days before is fine. But I always want to arrive by here. So we have to think about packing. Now, the athlete guide again actually has a packing list. So if we go back to our athlete guide and somewhere within this athlete guide, let's have a look, see if I can find it, it does have kind of a packing list. And it's a recommendation, but it's pretty good. It goes through, notice here it's got all the course details. This really is your friend, it tells you about the vendors, other things you can do, the courses, exactly what's gonna be involved, the rules, make sure you understand you can't draft, how long you have to overtake people, know all about those things, if you can ask questions, but then there is a checklist. So you can kind of go through this and think about, now it is COVID, so you need a face mask, it says face covering, but hey, think of all the equipment you need um, for the actual event. Now I have my own one, uh, that I use and I kind of print it off. And the way I think about it is I lay it all out um, by event. So I think about, okay, general stuff I want for kind of the pre-start at the transition one when I'm checking my gear. So I think about things like, well, okay, in general I want chargers for my bike computer. Uh, I have a big pen so I can mark the bag, write my number on the bags. I have some unique tape so I can make my bag more easy to see. Then I want a shirt to wear while I'm traveling, waiting, some shoes to wear, my triathlon shorts, I wear those, the timing chip, triathlon watch, uh, nippies for me because, ouch, um, sunscreen. So ordinarily, there were sunscreen people at T1 and T2, and they cover you in sunscreen as you exit the transition tent. With COVID, there are no people applying sunscreen. So you need to be self-sufficient for the sunscreen. So make sure you've got sunscreen in your bags, so we're gonna talk about, so you can apply sunscreen. What I do is I'll shower the night before, I'll put on a full layer of sunscreen, and I'll sleep in that. Then the morning, I'll apply another full layer of sunscreen, and then I burn, I'm this pasty British skin, I'll apply more sunscreen at T1 and T2. Make sure you get it under where your shirts are, cause it's gonna rub, rub it away a little bit, so I'll put extra, remember your neck, head, etc., etc. So sunscreen, Super, super important. They're not gonna be people there to put that on you like there were in previous years. Uh, then, so I, I think, about, I use Tri-Tats. Again, there's no body marking for the COVID, but I still like to have my number on, so I'll use Tri-Tats. And I have a special training wedding band, not my regular metal ring. Then the morning clothes bag, wetsuit. They'll tell you in the morning if it's wetsuit legal or wetsuit optional. I'll talk more about that. I have a plastic bag. So the reason I have a plastic bag, it's just an old carrier bag from like a supermarket, I'll put that over my foot 
to slide into the wetsuit makes it much easier. There's no friction going into your wetsuit. So it just makes putting on the wetsuit that much easier. Then you pull the bag out, put it on the other foot, put that into the wetsuit. So just a, a cheap plastic bag from a supermarket is awesome to help put on the wetsuit. Then kind of obviously the swim cap, goggles. I apply a spray lubricant around my neck because what I found is when you're swimming in a wetsuit, it rubs on the back of your neck. It would actually split it open and I'd be bleeding. Um, so I put a, a lubricant around where it would actually touch the neck and it stops that. Also lubricant maybe around the arms. Anyway, it's going to rub um, some lubricant. I wear a sleeveless wetsuit. I have tr trouble with ones with arms. It's too restrictive for me. So I always wear a sleeveless wetsuit no matter what the temperature has never been a problem. But obviously your wetsuit. I basically think about from the feet upwards how I would get dressed. Again, sunscreen, drinks to put on the bike because I'm going to put drinks on my bike. I drink while I'm waiting, a bagel to eat while I'm waiting. I have a five hour energy. I have two spare inner tubes. Yes, I've got those on the bike as well, but I don't want to use those up if maybe my tires had popped overnight. So I take spare inner tubes. I take a headlamp. The headlamp is super important. Just a little cheap headlamp is fine, but in the morning it's going to be dark. So if I'm pumping up my tires, I don't want to be trying to deal with a torch. So a little headlamp really is helpful for pumping up the tires. If you have to go to the bathroom, which you will, um, maybe just the grounds uneven. A little headlamp, don't blind everyone. Maybe have it pointing down, but a headlamp is super, super useful. I always have a headlamp with me. And obviously your hotel key, a car key if you're on your own. Then I think about my bike transition bag. I have a giant Ziploc bag, a huge bag. And we can kind of see that in the picture, these giant bags I have right here. And the reason for that is I actually put my gear in those bags and then I put that inside the bag they give you. Now the reason I do that is if it rained or if it maybe there was moisture or something, I don't want my gear all getting wet. Now there are other tricks you can tie up the bags. Maybe some people put a cup over the top to stop rain being able to go in them. But I really like just using a big Ziploc bag and I do that. I, I carry a towel, I have a bottle of water, and I have mouthwash, I have sort of anti-chafing and more sunscreen. A bottle of water is to rinse off my feet if it was sandy, then I can dry them off. I get those kind of surgical shoe covers that you might see in like a surgery because if the ground is muddy in bike transition, I don't want to get in my cleats. So I put those over my bike shoes and then I just take them off just as I get into my bike at the mount line and you, you put them in the trash. So I like putting those. Some people use carrier bags, doesn't matter. Again, I think shoes going upwards, uh, my socks. I'm already wearing my tri shorts, but my bike um, shirt, a cap to stop the sweat under my helmet, my bike computer and my nutrition. For the run, shoes, socks, I'm already wearing my tri shirt and my tri shorts, a little belt to put my race number on. Maybe I'm carrying my gels. I like to carry a little water bottle, sunglasses, hat, again, more anti-chafe, different type of lubricant, sunscreen, salt. I have a little pacing computer so I can run, walk, maybe a nutrition bar. But all of this I've kind of got um, actually within well, how I pack. So I break all of those things down. I like to have that. And so I don't really use the special needs bags. So you do have the option of special needs bags that will be available during the event, halfway through bike, halfway through run. On the bike, you might, for example, put spare inner tubes. You might put your nutrition. The run might be nutrition. Again, I carry it with me. Um, so I don't use those, but you absolutely could if that's how you want to train and that's super. You do how you train, whatever works best for you. So you've packed, you've got everything you need. Make sure you're self-sufficient. And what I mean by that is like, uh, the bike can be a big stressful part because there's equipment and equipment can fail. And we always think of a puncture. So when I think about this outwards, know how to change a flat. Go through it, change the flat on your bike. Know if you have to have extenders on your valves, if you've got kind of deeper, maybe 80 millimeter, 60 millimeter rims. Don't let that be a worry. Oh my God, if I get a puncture, how do I change a puncture? Just do it, change it. Uh, in my little back bag on my bike, I've got two inner tubes. I've got three gas canisters. Um, I've got the little tire levers so I can get the tire out. I've got a little set of hex keys so I can tighten or loosen certain things. There are mechanics on the course, but there's only so many mechanics. And I don't want to be waiting 30 minutes for someone to help me change a flat. So know how to change a flat.
go through that, have at least two inner tubes on you just to cover those things. Know how if you have to have valve extenders, how those work, how to use it. Just be self-sufficient on the bike. Don't need anyone to help you. Again, remove stress. I don't want to rely on something else. And really make sure you're not changing anything. Um, so horror story time. It was my second Ironman, it was Ironman 2016. And I got one of those companies that come to your house to service your bikes. And they was like, oh, you should put bigger tires on your bike. I think it was from 23 to 25. And I, was, I, I don't know much about bikes. I was like, sure. So they put the 25 millimeter tires on and on the back, it just didn't work. They even filed away part of my back brake mechanism. I was looking at them like, what are you doing? But I didn't know and I wasn't questioning them. But it didn't work, so I had to put 23. But on the front, the 25 seemed to work fine. Go out to Ironman Texas. Race morning is when you pump up the tires to 100 PSI. Front tire wouldn't turn anymore. Uh, 100 PSI, we never pumped up the tire. It got stuck on the bike frame, wouldn't turn. I tried to kind of, I loosened the wheel and pushed it down a little bit and tightened it back up. But of course, when you start riding, so during the ride, it would start this hideous squealing noise and there was nothing to be done. I had to let out a huge amount of air out of my front tire to fix it. So that was horrible. So nothing new on race day. Don't be a John. Uh, you don't want those things to happen to you. So make sure you've tested your equipment, you pump the tires up to 100 PSI and practiced on them. We're gonna let air out of them before we put them in transition. But make sure everything's tip top, working, you've done a ride on it. I, I don't want no stresses. So you've, you've packed your bags, you've got the packing list. Um, in the COVID times, we have to pre-register for a check-in, a registration time. So at three days out, I can go through registration. And I can also do that up to two days out. Now, in the COVID days, you're going to get a time slot. This is going to tell you uh, it's a one hour window. And I've, like from Tulsa, I've booked the Thursday because the event is on Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday. So I'm going to drive to Tulsa. I live in Texas, don't let the accent fool you. So I'll drive, I'll arrive, I'll, I'll go and register. So that's three or two days before. You cannot register the day before. Now, if there's been a disaster, if there's been a flight problem or something's happened, you can call them. And I know they've let people in exceptional circumstances register the day before, but it's not common. I'm registering here. It's COVID, you need a mask with you. So you're gonna go through registration. There's some paperwork to fill in. And what they're actually gonna give you I'm going to get kind of my timing chip that's going to go around your ankle. You're going to get a race packet. So that race packet has things like your bib that you're going to wear only during the marathon. You wear that. There's a whole bunch of stickers. So the stickers, there's two for your bike. There's a big one that kind of goes on the back. There's a little one that goes on the front on the stem of your bike. There's a sticker that goes on your helmet. And then there's stickers that go on each of the five bags. And they're gonna give you five bags. These are for the various points of the day. And then normally you get some kind of nice backpack as well. And there's a bunch of information. There might be a voucher for a meal. There's various things, but you're gonna get all of those different items as part of that. And then of course you can go to the store. There's an Iron Man store where I can buy all sorts of things with Iron Man logos on, event logos on. Generally, the finisher gear is not available till the day after the event. Some, a couple of times, and I think maybe in COVID they're doing it differently, but generally it's not going to sell the finisher gear. Then, of course, just in the, this is all at the Iron Man Village. So the registration is at the Athlete Village, which is going to be by the finish line. And it's all in the, the Athlete Guide where that is. We're going to go through. Again, get your timing chip, get your bags, get your race packet, the bib and the stickers. Um, they're gonna give you a bracelet as well that they're gonna put on you. So that bracelet has your race number on it. It doesn't come off, so once it's on, it's on. You're gonna wear that for the rest of your life. Um, but you're gonna get all of those things. And, and that's really it. So for those days, you're done. Now you're gonna get these five bags. Now it does show you those in the athlete guide. They're five different colors. So if we go back over to the athlete guide, and let's scroll all the way back up. It's like page 13 or 15 or something. Gear bags. 
So here we go. We get five different gear bags. White, blue, red, orange, and black. And it tells you what they're for. So we have a morning clothes bag, a bike gear bag, a run gear bag, a bike special needs bag, and a run special needs bag. So what we're gonna do with these bags is, as the names kind of suggest, the white bag is stuff that I'm using race morning. Maybe it's those spare inner tubes, maybe it's the shirt I'm wearing, some flip flops, my car key. And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna carry that with us, and then just before we kind of start, there's gonna be a place to drop that off near the start line. And so that, we're gonna put all the stuff we wanna keep in that morning clothes bag, we're gonna drop it off as we kind of start, there'll be a drop off point. So over here, there's gonna be a kind of morning clothes bag, drop off. So we're gonna keep that with us, drop it off right at the end, put our sandals and our shirt we were wearing, maybe sunscreen, whatever stuff we had, we're gonna drop that off. And they're gonna make sure that's there ready for us at the end, they're gonna transport that for us. We're gonna drop it off, seal it up, you're good. On those clothes bags, remember those five plastic bags, we're gonna stick the big stickers they gave us on them. I'm also gonna write in a big black pen my race number in case the sticker falls off. I draw a little symbol on it, a bit of special tape so I can see it more easily as well. The next bag, okay, so the blue bag, the blue bag will be waiting for us here. So this is our blue bag. So this contains all of our bike gear. So we're gonna take the bike gear out of the bag and put that gear on. All of the stuff we were swimming with, maybe like wetsuits, cap, goggles, all of our swim gear, we're gonna put into the bag. And then once again, we're gonna drop that bag off at a point, and we seal it up, and that will be available as, to us at the end as well. So we're gonna take the bike gear out, our helmet, our shoes, everything else, and then our towel, our wetsuit, our cap, our goggles, all of the swim stuff we put into the bag we just took the bike gear out of, and we drop off that bike gear bag. That's how we get the wetsuit stuff back. The red bag, well that's gonna be available for us at T2. So this is our run gear bag. So that's our running shoes, running sunglasses, um, running cap, whatever you have. So once again, the run gear comes out and we put it on and the bike gear goes into it and we drop it off. So that, that's the idea, we're never losing our gear. There's no like, oh, we've lost stuff. These bags are dual purpose. We take the bike gear out, we put the swim stuff in, we drop it off. We take the run gear out at T2, put the bike stuff in our helmet, drop it off. And these bags will all three of them, along with our bike, be available at the end, at this T2. So we're gonna we'll pick up our bike, the run gear, the bike gear, and the morning clothes bags at the end. So we have to obviously pack these bags. Now again, I go through that same kind of list that I have. So if I go back to my kind of site, the way I lay it out, I lay it down kind of feet going upwards. What I'll actually do, you can see my morning clothes bag, I have my wetsuit in case I need it. Flip-flops, shirt, everything else, the little plastic bag here that I use to put on my wetsuit. Then I lay out, okay, the bike gear, it's from shoes up to shirt, up to hat running shoes, socks, belt, sunglasses, hat. I'm gonna put all of that in the bags. I'm gonna pack it up, so I put it in my plastic bag, my big gallon Ziploc bags, and I put it in the gear bag. So you've packed everything, then you're gonna unpack it and check it, and then pack it again. And then unpack it, pack it, pack it. You're gonna do that a whole bunch of times. It's natural, everyone panics, oh my God, have I forgot something. Make sure if you do unpack it, you pack it in a very clear space so you can see if you've forgotten something to put it back in, so I won't do it too many times. Um, even when I go and drop these things off, I end up unpacking it quickly. That's why I like the Ziploc bag. I can kind of see everything I have without having to actually take stuff out. But on those bags, I'll use a big black marker and actually write my number on the bag in addition to the actual sticker that they give you in case that sticker came loose. And I put like a little symbol, something that I can actually help identify. So you've packed your bags. You've done all the packing. You're ready. Now relax follow your nutrition plan, eat, maybe have a little walk, um, but just relax. 
if there is an athlete briefing, attend it. Now again, in the COVID days, they're going to be virtual. But it, it's good to attend these, especially if it's your first one of that event, to just hear. Again, the athlete guide will go over this. The schedule will go over this. But attend it. It will, again, help remove any of those doubts about well, what's happening, what do I do, etc. It takes away any nervousness. Okay, now it's the day before. So this is when we actually do check-in. And by check-in, it's the bike and our T1 and T2 bags. Now, depending on what it, this is, obviously your T1 and bike will definitely be at the same place. The T1 has got your bike gear in it. That's that bag. You will go and drop those off at T1. Normally, your run bag, you will drop off at T2. Now, for Tulsa, for example, they actually have the option that I can drop all of these off at T2 and they will transport my bike and bike bag to T1 for me. Um, I'm not going to do that. I would rather get my bike there myself and see it racked up and see my bag there just because that's me. But if you have maybe um, vehicle challenges and you can't do that, they are offering that. That's not that common. So just be advised. There might be third parties like Tri Bike Transport sometimes do a service where they'll go and do that for you, whatever. But that's the only thing I'm doing the day before is checking. I have to take my bike, make sure you've got the stickers on it. When you go to the T1, drop off your bike, they're gonna take a picture of your bike. Just the standard stuff. You're gonna rack your bike on a pole, normally by the saddle facing outwards um, from where your number is. And I'm gonna drop off my, T, my T1 bag. And I'm gonna drop off my T2 bag. Now, normally, there are these big lines of the bags. They organize by race number. And as you come out the swim, I'm gonna go through this, you grab the bag. I think in the COVID times, there's no transition tents. They normally are tents at T1 and T2. There are no tents for COVID. So I think your gear might actually be at where the bike is. Again, they're gonna tell you, you can't go wrong. At the check-in, there are people everywhere. There are so many fantastic volunteers. They're gonna help you. You don't have to really know anything. As long as you get to the right place, which is gonna be very obvious, they're gonna tell you all of this stuff. They're going to tell you where to go. They're going to help you put your bag in the right place. Don't stress it. So again, but check-in is the day before. I have to get my bike done. I can't take it on the day. The day before is check-in. I'm dropping my bike and T1 bag off. It's got my bike gear in it at T1. My T2 bag I'm dropping off at T2. And again, now I, I relax. Now, when you drop your bike off, do not have your tires fully inflated. You always hear these horror stories about well, they're left out all day, especially if it's hot and they burst. So then race morning, you've got two flat tires. So I let air out. I maybe have them at 60 PSI or something. So when I'm racking my bike, my tires have got a lot of the air taken out of them. Relax. Now I say relax, it's gonna be hard. Uh, I barely ever sleep the night before still. Still 15 Ironmans down. I still don't sleep that well the night before, but try and get at least some sleep. But I will wake up early, race morning, so if the start, if I think about it, it's maybe like 7 a.m. is fairly typical. I'm waking up, I'm normally awake by 3 a.m., but maybe it's 4 a.m. Um, I eat, get some nutrition in me. Normally about 4 a.m., um, T1, T2 are open. Now that's a big deal because I want to go to my bike. Again, logistics. If T1 is a distance from the start, what they're typically gonna have you do is T2 will be open so you could check your run gear, maybe you're putting something in that you didn't wanna leave it out overnight. They will be a shuttle to T1. They are not expecting you to get there on your own. There will be, by T2, there'll be coaches that will transport you to T1. Don't stress it, Tulsa is doing exactly that. And then I think it's a short walk to the start because it's a little bit of a point to point swim. And then at T1, I will go to my bike. I will put my I put a couple of bottles of drink on, just a water, so I've got something to start with, and I pump up my tires. There are mechanics there with air hoses that you can queue up, and they will put air in your tires. There are pumps lined all along the fence. There are friendly people that will help you with the pump. 
Headlight is useful, so you can see the little dial says I'm pumping up to 100 PSI. I can make sure I'm going to 100 PSI. Don't on race day pump up to some level you've never done before. If you always train at 100 PSI, do 100 PSI. If you do 105, do whatever you do. Nothing new on race day. I like 100, I'm heavier. Um, I'm always worried about I'm gonna pop something, so I'll, I'll do 100. But on race morning, you get to go to your bike, drop off if you want nutrition on the bike, and you're gonna pump up your tires to whatever pressure you want then. That's the point. You have plenty of time. If something's happened overnight, if you have a flat, you just change it out. That's why I like in my morning clothes bag, a couple of spare inner tubes, so I'm not having to take inner tubes off my bike. I don't wanna use that equipment up, I wanna keep that there. So uh, anyway, I've, I've eaten, I've put on my timing chip, make sure you've got that with you, and the wetsuit. Now, while you are waiting, make sure you've got a COVID mask as well. Typically at T1 and at T2, there'll be people kind of calling out, um, is it wetsuit legal? It says wetsuit legal, which I think it's up to like 76.1 degrees, and then wetsuit optional, which I think is up to 83.8. So if it's wetsuit legal, everyone's wearing a wetsuit. Some people may not, they're super, super great and don't want it. Most will be. Wetsuit optional is you can wear the wetsuit, you're gonna start last, which is not a big deal. A ton of people will be doing that. And you can't qualify for Kona or win age group. Not a concern. So if you're not the strongest swimmer, wear a wetsuit. Don't be embarrassed about it. You still get the full 17 hours. Your 17 hours starts from when you enter the water. You're not losing any time. Who cares? Wear a wetsuit if it makes you feel better. Wetsuit does add a lot of buoyancy. So if you're a weaker swimmer, it makes the swim so much easier to have that wetsuit on. Now. If it's warm, do consider overheating. So just be aware of that. I'll be honest, I've always worn a wetsuit. I always wear a sleeve the slow, whether it's cold or warm, I've never had a problem. But just make sure you do bear that in mind, you could get too hot. But they're gonna tell you the water temperature, they'll be shouting it out at T1 and T2. If it's wetsuit legal, is it wetsuit optional? You'll know. If you don't wear the wetsuit and you've got it with you, you're just gonna put it in your morning clothes bag. When you drop that off, it's not a big deal. So we apply our sunscreen, we make sure we've got a timing chip on, we've got a triathlon watch, we're ready kind of, had some nutrition, had a drink. There's porta potties here. They can be big lines. So just be advised, if you think you're gonna use it, maybe queue up before you think you're gonna need it. So you're not kind of caught short waiting for 15 minutes at the porta potty line. If there is a little bit of a walk from T1 to the swim start, like there is at Texas, for example, it's like a mile walk. Um, I think Tulsa is gonna be something similar. You'll just, once you've finished with your bike, you'll just walk up to the start line. There'll be a whole mass of people, you're just gonna follow those people. And then try and relax a little bit. When it's near the start, if it is wetsuit, put your wetsuit on, you kind of put the lubricant around your neck or wherever it is that you need the things, the swim cap, your goggles, make sure you've got all your equipment. And then you can drop off your morning clothes bag. Again, you've put everything else in there, car keys, everything else, do it up tight and you just drop that off and it's gonna be there available for you. My headlamp, that's when I go and put that in. For the goggles, if it's gonna be sunny and you think there's sun in your eyes, maybe wear a tinted pair of goggles. You wanna be able to sight, you wanna be able to see the people and see the, the boys. Again, the course is laid out in the athlete guide, so make sure you're aware of what the course is. Is it multiple loops? So sometimes the swim will be just a point to point. So if I look at Tulsa, for example, you're kind of kind of swimming up a bit, turning. Red boys mean a turn. Normally yellow is you're going out, orange is coming back. And then it's just a straight line, and then you're in. So it's a little bit of a point to point. It's not a huge distance, maybe a mile, probably a bit less actually than that. But understand what it is. If it's loops, make sure you're kind of counting and don't go and end up doing extra loops. It's, it's never more than two loops. Uh, sometimes you have to actually get out and get back in again for the second loop. It varies, but it will show it to you in the athlete guide. Know what the course is, you're gonna be fine. Now, it's a rolling start. So what that means is at the start, you will there'll be signs held up for what you think your estimated swim time will be. 40 minutes, 50 minutes, hour, hour 10, hour 30, two hours, be honest. You don't wanna put yourself in a faster group that's just gonna suck. There are gonna be people swimming over you. So I always put myself in the hour 30 group. Uh, I'm fine with that. I'm not in a rush. I'm not gonna 
set any records on the swim, put yourself in a group and it's just gonna be this rolling start to actually do that. Now, the swim is often the most stressful part for many people. You have these pictures of these masses of people and these arms and legs flailing. No one is there to try and stress you out or hit you or drag you. If you get some arms or legs near you, it's an accident. No one means anything by it. If you are a less experienced, strong swimmer, stay on the outside. Sure, it might add 30 seconds to your hour 15 time. Who cares? That's much better than getting being stressed out and, and panicking. So you can stay towards the outside. It's, it's really not as bad. Again, I've done that quite a few times. If you feel stressed in the swim, stop and get help. There are canoes along here. You don't get disqualified if you need to stop, catch your breath. You can stop at a canoe, say, okay, I just need to catch breath for a second. You can hold on. You're not getting disqualified for that. It's only if someone helps you and pulls you along the swim course. So don't risk yourself. You can stop, have a breath, get yourself back together again and then carry on with the swim. So again, don't stress out. If you're, if you're really stressed out and need help, call out for help, help, help. Again, nothing to be embarrassed about. It might just be a stress thing, whatever it is, get the help. Everyone is your friend there. You're not, they're not competitors. It's the most phenomenal community you're ever gonna see. Everyone's chatting and helping if you have questions. So don't overstress it. There are people along the whole course. Don't let yourself get into a bad situation though. If you're feeling stressed, stop, go to a canoe, recompose, then just carry on. So the swim is over. We get out of the swim. Now, if it's wetsuit, there are normally wetsuit strippers. Uh, there won't be in the COVID days. Wetsuit strippers, you'll lay down, they'll yank your wetsuit off, hold onto your trunks to make sure those don't come off as well. They will not be there for the, in the COVID days. So you're gonna have to get your own wetsuit off. But you're gonna run along. Again, normally would grab your T1 bag with your bike gear in it. Maybe some slight differences here, but it, it will either be at your bike or you're gonna grab the bag still, and then you will go to your bike. There are no transition tents in COVID days. Normally there are, but there'll be porta potties if you need to use the bathroom. If you're gonna change, you can't have public nudity. So you can buy, like, I think, like beach towels that cover all of you if you do wanna change. For me, I just put my bike shirt on. I'm already wearing my shorts no matter what. But you're gonna take all your swim gear, your wetsuit, your cap, put it in the morning clothes, sorry, in the T1 bag, you just took your bike gear out of, seal it back up, and there's gonna be a drop-off point. And now you're on your bike. You're, you're pedaling along. Again, I have a towel in my bag so I can dry off a little bit. But now, you're cycling. Again, know the course. Most bikes are loops of some kind. So if we kind of keep looking actually at this, you'll have a picture of the bike course. They're well marked. There's nothing to panic over. But just be aware, oh, is it two loops? Is it three loops? <clears throat> what it is, it has mile markers every kind of 10 miles. There are aid stations at least every 15 miles that will have that nutrition on. I always swap out my water on my Gatorade bottle no matter how much I've drunk. I want a fresh one on me at all times because you never know, maybe something bad happens at the next aid station, they're missing something. So even if you don't need it, switch out your Gatorade, switch out your water. Always make sure you have a full one. About halfway through again, you're gonna see the special needs and it will be marked on the map where the special needs point is. It'll be here somewhere. I don't know where it is on this legend. Uh, oh, bike personal needs is there. Okay, so it's there. See, it's about halfway, 50 to 60 miles. There'll be people and you kind of shout out your number and they'll, they'll hand you your special needs bag. On the bike, they will be handing out the drinks at the aid stations, even in the COVID times. So they're still gonna go past, you can, you can grab that. And there are places to throw the trash. Don't throw it at people. There are volunteers, they're out there to help us and I'll get paid, thank the volunteers, thank the police. Um, the police probably get a lot of abuse because they're having to shut down roads and the motorists don't like that. So as much as you can say, well, thank you. Be very polite, that they're out there to help us. Uh, appreciate the crowds, really we soak this in. Everyone's kind of there to help. If you get stuck, again, be self-sufficient. There are mechanics on the course, but there's only a finite number of them. So you really wanna be able to change tires yourself, but they are out there. Other cyclists might help you. You're not supposed to get help from outside though. Um, so just bear that in mind. So we're going through, so we're, we're doing the bike. We've maybe got our special needs. 
um, then there's gonna be a dismount line. Now, one thing to bear in mind, um, actually, before we get to that, especially on the bike, pay attention to your nutrition plan. If you eat every 20 minutes, eat every 20 minutes. If you drink every 10, drink every 10. Make sure you're drinking enough. If it's really hot, um, maybe you need to drink a little bit more, but just be mindful you can drink too much. I think when I did, maybe it was Lake Placid, maybe it was Chattanooga actually, it was really hot beyond what it was expecting. I was drinking a ton and I drank too much. It messed up my stomach and I was just dry heaving on the bike, which was horrible. So just follow your nutrition plan and follow your heartbeat power plan. It can be tempting to go nuts. Realize your body has been trained to absorb nutrients and work at a certain rate. If you suddenly crank up the intensity, well, you're gonna burn yourself out, but your body will not absorb the nutrients the same way. So you've trained a certain way. This is just a really long training day. Follow that training plan on this day as well. So follow your nutrition plan, follow your power plan, don't deviate. So at the end, there's gonna be a dismount line. You're gonna slow down. Normally there were bike catchers, they'll go and mount, um, mount your bike for you. I don't think there is in COVID. I think we're gonna go mount our bikes ourselves. We'll grab our run gear bag, take our run gear out, put our bike gear into the run gear bag, get chained, drop off the run gear bag at the drop-off point. And now we're running. Uh, I relax after the marathon. I'm not worried about mechanical failures anymore. So, I mean, it's a hard part for me, but now I can just relax. Um, reapply sunscreen. So that was another horror story for me is sunburn. And you're gonna hit lows. Just everyone hits a low. Um, for my first ever Ironman at T2, well, I actually tried a new sunscreen I'd never used before. And it, I don't think, it, I think it was olive oil. On the bike, I could feel my flesh cooking. And by the time I got to T2, I was completely sunburned all over my legs, my arms, I was in agony. I was exhausted. And I remember sitting in T2 with my head in my hands for about 10 minutes. My transition time for T2 was like 15 minutes. Because I was in agony, I was, I was like, how can I possibly do a marathon? You're gonna hit these lows but realize why are you there? And I was like, I can do this, I can walk it. I still had a lot of time. I, I knew I could walk the marathon and still succeed, but don't do new things. Don't try new sunscreen on the day. Um, I, it was actually second degree sunburn. I went to the emergency room the next day and it was second degree sunburn, uh, so that was fun. Um, but if you do find a low point, just Try and regather. Don't panic. We all get them. At mile 21 of the marathon, nearly everyone hits a low point. It's fine. We're nearly there. Sometimes I measure them in, okay, it's only two half marathons to go. It's only this many football fields to go. Whatever helps you, sure, use that mental math. Um, but you're going to be fine. Um, you're going to do it. You're all good. Remember why you're doing it. Um, sometime, I remember another low for me was at Santa Rosa. I was going really slow. My family were at the finishing line and I was just, I'm letting them down. I'm making them wait because I'm so slow and terrible today. And at one point I, actually, I was crying just because I felt so guilty. So emotions and things are going to flow. Deep breath, recompose. It's all going to be fine. Aid stations every mile. Again, halfway you're going to have that special needs. I like to use salt on the run. Uh, maybe I should on the bike as well. If you find you're peeing a lot, it might be you've not done enough salt, train with it. But you get these little salt canisters and you kind of lick your thumb, you flip it over and then lick the salt off your thumb. I do that every mile on the run. And I find that really helps a lot with being able to maintain uh, and keep going, stopping cramp, everything else. Again, there's mile markers every mile. At mile 25, you're going to get superpowers. All the pain will go away. You can do anything. You're there. Enjoy the finish line. Don't, if you take anything else away, apart from don't panic and nothing new, enjoy the finish line. If it adds 30 seconds to your time, but take a breath, soak it in, soak up the people, soak up that finish line, enjoy it. Don't, don't get tunnel vision and just sprint as fast as you can. Enjoy it, maybe you only do this once. Enjoy the finish line, celebrate your victory, because all that pain, everything you've gone through is gonna be worth it. Because as you cross that finish line, you are an Iron Man, and there's really nothing like it. Trick Miner, John Seville, Bob Zolman, and Christopher Bolin, all together, you are an Iron Man. Stop.
Go in the corner, John. We'll see you in October. You are an Iron Man. John Saville, you are an Iron Man. So you've gone through that. You're going to get your medal, your hat, your shirt. They're going to take your timing chip. Make sure you get your picture taken with the medal. Um, go and eat, drink. Uh, if you don't have any family with you, now if you have family, in that race packet, there's also an equipment pickup voucher. They can, for you, go to here and pick up your bike, run gear, bike gear, and morning clothes bag for you. They can do that. It's got a little ticket, they're allowed to do that. If you're on your own, once you've finished, I don't sit down. If I sit down, I'm, I'm done. I will go and walk and I'll pick up my bike and my three bags and then walk to the hotel and then protein, food. I can never sleep the night after an Ironman, ever. Um, but make sure you eat something. You may get shivers. Sometimes you get tingling. It, it will pass, but again, if, you, if you're worried, get medical help. Uh, my first Ironman where I got the sunburn, I finished and they put me in a wheelchair and I went to the medical tent for an hour. And I experienced the worst pain of my life because they got a cold flannel and they put it over my sunburn I don't know what that did, it set a cramp through my stomach and I just doubled over and I was screaming. So that was fun. Um, but there's medical aid. If you don't feel good and you're on your own, go and seek help. Don't risk being on your own and there's a problem. But you're gonna be fine. Um, just follow the plan. Everyone is there to help you. Now the day after, the big thing is, now obviously there's a ward ceremony. Uh, that doesn't apply to me but the store will be open. Now the store typically opens at 7 a.m. I get there at 6 a.m. and I just go and sit outside so I have a decent place in the queue. There will be a long queue, but I mean, it moves pretty fast. They let in so many people at a time into the store. You get the finisher athlete shirts, finisher regular shirts, finisher polo shirts, finisher jackets. I buy it all, because uh, that's just who I am. But go and celebrate. It's available online as well. And again, it's open all day. They don't tend to sell out, so you can take your time. But I don't sleep anyway, so I just get up, I have a breakfast, I get to the store early. I'm normally like third or fourth person in line. And, and that, that's really it. I mean, the key point is, it seems a lot. It really does, I totally get it. But it, it's really not that bad. It, it's packing a bunch of stuff feet up to head to make sure you don't forget things, have a packing list and tick things off. As you pack the bags, tick things off. Ask questions, read the athlete guide, attend an athlete briefing. Registration, three and two days before. Check-in the day before. Bike and T1 bag at T1, T2 bag at T2. Show up with plenty of time, pump up your tires, check your equipment, enjoy the day. If you're pro, sure, you're going nuts. Most of us, we're not. Remember why you're there. Soak it in, enjoy it. Definitely enjoy that finish line. You're gonna be fine, you've prepared. Hopefully that removes some of the stress and the unknowns about it. Um, and if you're doing Tulsa or Coeur d'Alene or Montreblanc or Kona this year, maybe I'll see you there. But uh, good luck.